I don't, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, welcome everybody. Um, we are recording this meeting for anybody who couldn't join us live or for anybody who is here live and wants to review this meeting afterwards, um, you'll have it recorded because we're gonna cover a lot of stuff. Um, I'm going to post in the chat um, the link to the slide presentations. Um, there are some links to additional supporting documents. Um, so having the slides will give you access to all of that. This was my reminder to record the meeting so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> um, so the CASAS in Rhode Island team is Cedalia De Silva, myself, um, Kim Libby, and Nadine Vieira. Um, Nadine is doing uh, Pearson view testing this morning, so she couldn't be with us. Um, and Sedalia is not feeling well, so she's not here. So I'm I'm flying solo today. And I told Jane that the, uh, before we started the meeting that um, I kind of feel like I'm operating without like my right arm or something like that. Like <laughs> we really are a team, and and we all kind of um, have specialized knowledge when it comes to CASAS. So I'm feeling like whew, I don't I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Do, do it justice the way um, Sedalia would if she were here. Um, but if there are any questions that I can't answer or additional information that people need, um, we'll make sure that we get it to you after the meeting. So I wanted to start just to check in with anybody. Um, I have a lot on the agenda, but are there any um, burning questions that people wanted to make sure they had answered this morning? You can either unmute or add it to the chat. So I don't see anybody um, responding by voice, but if you type things in the chat, that's fine. Um, and because most of my content is probably going to take up the whole hour that we have together, um, just please ask questions as we go along, because I don't necessarily have um, like spot, a spot reserved. Like I don't have 10 minutes at the end of the meeting for it. So just interrupt me as questions come up. And I can stay on past 1230 as well if anybody has questions. All right, so our agenda for this morning, um, we're going to talk about um, what CASAS is looking like in Rhode Island. Um, we're going to talk about TOPS Pro Enterprise post testing and how to proxy student test records for the new fiscal year. There are some new assessments that are um, going to be coming out soon, so I want to let you know about those. Um, and there are some additional CASAS assessments that you might not be aware of um, that we want to make sure everyone in Rhode Island knows that they can take advantage of. And I have the updated Rhode Island assessment policy to share with you if you don't have it already. And then there's a few more for your information and uh, we'll be looking ahead to next fiscal year and what's coming up next. So here in Rhode Island, um, Sophie included on the quarter two, quarter three report, um, a question about um, how people are using um, testing assessments um, in their programs. And so I wanted to share out that data with you. Again, you'll have um, a copy of these slides. Um, so and I, I'll post it again in the chat for anyone um, who came after I posted it the first time. Um, so you, you can um, view this information on your own time. But you can see from here, we have one program that's using best literacy. And then it looks like all the other programs are using a combination of either the CASAS Life and Work reading, which is for ESOL students, um, or the listening, also ESOL students, um, and then CASAS goals is going to be for AE students. And then we also asked um, which uh, type of tests um, programs are using. So you can see a majority of programs are using paper tests. Um, some programs are using um, a computerized version of the test. A few programs uh, have jumped into remote. Oh, you. I'm sorry, I messed up, I was putting this together really quick. <laughs> I messed up these two columns. You'll see this is uh, copied. I believe this column is people who are doing remote testing and these might be people who are learning to do remote testing. So I'll, I'll fix this after the meeting is over um, to correct what these columns are, but these both have to do with remote testing. And then which programs are using professional, um, provisional uh, educational functioning levels this year, which will also be available next year, and anyone who's using the reading level indicator, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Any questions about this data before I move on? No, Kim, but since you're going to change it anyway, um, mm -hmm. CCRI is doing remote 
um, testing. So yeah, there's, I know there's been some, learning it. we're actually doing it now. So. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's been some shifts um, since this was first asked, yeah. um, you know, several months ago. So yeah, it might not be like completely accurate, but that's good to know. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to start with um, talking about TOPS Pro Enterprise at the top because we often have conversations in these meetings um, about all the things that TE can do, um, only to find out that not very many programs even have access to TE. So I wanted to just give some background information about what TE is, um, what's possible, because as we go through the rest of the meeting, um, I'll probably be referencing it. <laughs> so. Let me start before before we actually get into this. Um, if you could respond either with your voice or in the chat, um, how many programs um, actually are using TE right now? We use it. The Genesis Center, CCRI. Yep, and we're using it at Rural. Progressive Latino is. And that might be it. And that's that's kind of what we saw is that it's, um, you know, fewer programs are using it um, than not using it. Um, one of the things in the past um, that I had heard from people around the state is that it felt cost prohibitive. Like it felt like, you know, it's thousands of dollars to use it. And that was true in the past. Um, but that's changed. So right now, um, any program can access TOPS Pro Enhanced, the enhanced version. So, so sometimes you'll see or you'll hear us talk about there's a basic version and there's an enhanced version. I assumed that the enhanced version must be more expensive. And when it comes to buying test units, that's true. Um, but I, I contacted CASAS yesterday and I said, I just want to make sure I'm giving the right information at this meeting tomorrow. You know, how much does it cost? And if you go with the basic, which has less features available to you, you have to pay an $8,000 setup fee, which is like crazy. Like what program is going to pay $8,000 <laughs> to, to access TE? And I'll talk more about what TE can do in a minute. Um, but if you go with the enhanced version, which gives you more reporting, has more features, you only have to pay $360. So what you're paying for is 100 web test units and a $15 processing fee. And those test units, um, they never expire. So you can pay $360 and have access to TE and not have to pay anything additional um, unless you need more testing units. So for programs who are using paper-based testing, who have said, you know, I'm interested in reports, but I, you know, I'm not doing e-testing, so I don't really think I need this. Um, if you are using paper-based testing, you can still use TE um, to get reports if you're putting data into the system. So some of the things that TE can do for you, and, and I should probably slow down and say that TE is um, TOPS Pro Enterprise, which is CASIS's database system. So this is the system that has um, all your student um, information in it. It's whatever you want to put into it. So it can have student information, um, student tests, um, which you can then use to run reports. There's more information about reports in the CASAS online training module four. And so I have a link to that in the slides. TE can also be used to duplicate e-test sessions for new fiscal years or for new sites that are using the e-test. So here at Rural, we have, you know, dozens and dozens of test sessions um, because we have separate test, separate test sessions for ESOL students, for AE students, for post-testing versus registration. So we have all these different test sessions and they can easily be duplicated from one fiscal year to the next using TE. TE also gives you free access to the reading level indicator, that's the RLI, um, which can be used for provisional testing. So again, even if you are doing paper-based testing at your organization, if you pay that $360 fee to get access to TE, you can then administer the RLI to any of your students. 
And the reading level indicator can be sent either by email and students can do the test on their phone. I'm sorry, on a computer, or you can text it to them and they can do it on their phone. And the RLI gives you a sense of what level the student is at and then can be used for provisional testing. Um, I'm sorry, provisional uh, leveling to get them into LASIS. Um, that has been really helpful here at RIRAL for our students who are close to being ready to pass the GED test and, um, and maybe just need a little bit of instruction, a little bit of review, a little bit of support, and then they're ready to take the GED test and pass. Um, by giving them the RLI, you know, they can finish the test in 20 to 30 minutes, we give them a provisional level, they pass the GED test, we get the outcome, everybody's happy. <laughs> And then TE can also be used um, to do uh, data exchange. So if we have a student here at RIRAL who is transferring to another program, we can, uh, exchange, if they have TE, if both programs have TE, we can send that data to them. So they will have the student's uh, most recent test records or the entire student test history if we want to share that with them um, and any other information that we have in our database um, that the student consents to. So the student must consent on both sides of the agency, um, but with both agencies, and then data can be transferred. So how are you? This is a concept that could also be used with uh, regional test centers. So as programs are thinking about continuing to offer some type of remote learning, um, it enables us to draw students from all over the state. So we've seen this at RIRAL where yeah, students yeah. who are in East Providence don't necessarily want to drive all the way to Woonsocket for a class, um, but if that class is offered online, they, they really like to participate. So if that student is not able to come up to Woonsocket to register and take a test, maybe they can test at a program that's closer to where they are, and then that program can transfer the data to us. And lastly, and I'm, I'm saying lastly because it's the last thing I have on this slide, but there's there's a lot more that TE can do as well. I'm just trying to keep this a little bit uh, condensed. Um, but there's a student portal that CASAS has, and I, I was trying to find the link for it to put it in these slides, and I did not find it um, before the meeting started, but I will continue to look for it um, so I can send you more information about what that is. But um, briefly, what it does is it gives students access to their own test scores, um, so they they have that, they don't have to request it from your program. And um, there's also ways to use um, attendance check-ins where students use their phone to check in to class and the attendance is automatically um, collected for you. So I'll pause again. Are there any questions about what we've covered so far in TE? Um, anybody who's already using TE, would you add anything um, to this about why, why you use it, why you like it? Sure, I'll, I'll add something. You know, I we when we switched to the computerized basis and using TE, and then with the switch to LASIS, it made it a whole lot easier to just kind of print out, you know, even if you didn't get the testing put into to LASIS right away, you can go back through TE, you can look up student records very easily, put it into a spreadsheet, and then it's right in front of you. So kind of made that transition a little easier. I, um, I wish they were more synchronous between the two, but um, it's still, it still is easier than it would have been to have to dig up every student file and every student test. And... Yep, exactly. That's, that's one of the things that we really like about it at RIRAL as well. Um, when we have, when we do post-testing and we have, you know, back when we were in person in the before times, you know, we would have hundreds of students post-testing within a few weeks. And um, our data team would, would print the reports of who tested each day and then just be able to quickly enter that information into um, LASIS or, or CALIS as it yeah. was. All right, so, um, so we, we are highly recommending that programs consider um, looking into TE. 
Um, if anybody wants to know more information about it, um, I'm happy to, to talk more. Um, I, I didn't think I'd have time to kind of demo it this morning, so, so I'm not doing that, but um, that's something that I can also do as well if, if anybody's interested. All right, we wanted to talk um, briefly about post-testing and proxying. So if you don't know, um, CASAS has what's called an e-test sampler, and I put the link in the presentation here. And this is um, available for teachers and students to use. Um, it's not like the CASAS test where, you know, we, we can't give students a paper version to practice with. <laughs> students have to, the, the actual CASAS tests are only used for, you know, proctored test settings. Um, but if you have students that um, want to practice before they take the actual test, um, this website will um, allow you to do that. So if I'm working um, with, you know, an ASC um, class, uh, maybe it's a GED prep class, and I know that most of my students are going to be post-testing um, in level D for reading goals, I can share this with them. No. Sorry. I, there it goes. I had to click on it twice. Sometimes you'll get a message that it's invalid and you just have to go back. If it's still showing that it's invalid, then you have to like, contact uh, tech support and they can help you with it. Um, okay, so this looks like exactly like what the e-test environment looks like. So if you have students that are going to be using e-tests, that's great for them. If they're using paper, it's similar. Um, so they can still practice online even though they're going to take a paper test. If you're a program that's never used e-test before, this gives you a preview of what it looks like. So students get to see the test item on the left side and responses on the right hand side. Uh, this is a great opportunity to show them how they can increase the size um, with these buttons down here. So a student can be able to see this. You'll notice as I'm zooming in, the test item is getting cut off. So it's another opportunity to show them how they can scroll over to see the entire um, text for the question that they're going to be answering. You can talk about what these numbers on the side mean um, for reading questions. So it, it's a really nice tool to have a conversation about the experience of taking the test, <laughs> strategies that students can use for while they're testing, um, you know, information they're going to see at the top, how they can hide this information if it's distracting, so there's a lot of a lot that you can do. Um, if you answer the question on the practice, it will tell you if you did not get it correct and students can try again. If they try again and do not get it correct on the second attempt, it will tell them what the correct answer is. And then it will move on to the next practice question. I should say too, this is a good opportunity to let them know that they might see the same test item but multiple test questions um, for this test item. Okay, after the practice, they then are directed to begin the test. And now I can see um, how many questions I have. 17 questions total. This one out of four indicates that this test item, this reading passage is gonna have four questions connected to it. As students are answering these questions, because it's no longer practice, it does not tell them if it's correct or not, and they will not find out at the end if it's correct or not. So you as an instructor would need to have that information if they're interested in knowing what the correct answers are. Is anybody um, using uh, the e-test sampler with their students? Jane is. Jane's the only one with her video on, so if anybody else is raising their hand, I can't see. <laughs> I'm not seeing anything in the chat either. This group is a little too quiet. <laughs> Come on, yes or no in the chat. <laughs> I need to know it's not just Kim and I here, <laughs> and Jane, and Melinda. <laughs> it's a yeah. Friday afternoon. It's, not quite, it's... not quite. You got minutes to go. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah, and it is end of the year, and I think we're all going a little nuts yet uh, right now, just with finishing this year, getting ready for the new year. So I, I completely understand. No, then why are you not answering now? Uh, all right, and Melinda, you're still unmuted, <laughs> just to let you know. 
All right, so Tom says that um, uh, it looks like they're not using it yet, um, but that and Norma says that maybe in the fall um, that you could use this tool. Yeah, I've, I've, when I've worked with students on it, I've found that um, it, it helps lower their anxiety a lot because they can just kind of like talk out loud about like, well, I, like this is confusing or how does this work or, you know, it just, it just kind of to do it, especially as a group in class can really help people kind of like work through the emotions around testing um, and understand this tool and, and realize like, oh, somebody else had that question. I wasn't the only one that was like, what does this pink arrow do? Um, Really and, and it's it's really helpful if you have a large group that's testing at once and you have just one of you. It really cuts down a lot of the running from station to station. And particularly we were doing it um, for pre-testing. And so we just showed it to our English language learners and it just kind of brought the anxiety down in terms of, oh, well, that, you know, that's not that hard kind of thing. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I were going somewhere brand new that I'd never been before and someone told me I had to take a test that was going to, you know, determine something important, like what level I'm going to get in, or, or maybe even whether I can get into this program at all, I would be very nervous. <laughs> like, I would find this helpful as well. Um, and Melinda says that um, Pawtucket is looking to move to e-testing um, and launch in the fall. Um, so yeah, Melinda, please reach out if you have any um, questions or need help with that transition. Um, we're happy to, to help you. Thank you. Um, you'll see that there's also um, math and the um, life and work listening is on here too. And life and work reading at the top. And there are um, additional languages that are available, um, but, that, but it's not going to translate the test for you. I'm not actually even sure what this does. It doesn't seem to be changing anything on my computer. Jane, have you, have you used different languages at all? I have not even paid attention to that, sadly. Uh, yeah, same. But. I don't. I don't know if this is new. It's not doing anything. So, yeah. would it would <laughs> it change can... the directions? Maybe put directions in another language? No, right? Because that would I mean, defeat the purpose of. But that that would be great. Um, even just for yeah, for that initial directions page. But I'm, right, I'm, it, it's all grayed out, and I'm trying to click on it, and nothing. Yeah, happens. no. So I'm not sure why mm -hmm. Cassis has this, but maybe it's something new that's coming. Um, I, I'll ask them. Yeah, if mm -hmm. there's a if there's a language option, that'd be awesome, especially for us being um, new to this and launching new. If that was an option for our students to have the instructions or directions in English, I mean right. in another language. I'm sorry, that would be uh, great to know. Um, we not we're not sure how easily they will be uh, transitioning from paper to the e-testing. So I'm sure that would be a great plus. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, I'm just gonna make this full screen again. Okay, um, so again, the link to the e-test samplers in the, the presentation. Um, at RIRAL, um, and I'm curious what other strategies um, programs are using, but at RIRAL, um, our post-testing strategy is, especially in COVID times, <laughs> is to test students who haven't made gains yet this year. So if we have students that have been with us since last summer, since the fall, and they've already made an EFL gain, um, we are not worried about testing them again, um, unless it's important to the student. Some students feel really important. It feels important to them, like they wanna know how they're making progress. So of course we would honor that. Um, but also it's important for students who are continuing to, who are planning to continue for summer classes because we need to have um, an updated test score um, before they start the new fiscal year. But if they're not coming back, they've already made an EFL game, um, we're just letting it go because it's, it, there's, no, there's no benefit <laughs> to us as a program in terms of them testing again, because they've already made that EFL game. Um, and usually teachers have enough information from working with students in class to have conversations about progress um, you know, and kind of next steps. Um, what are other programs doing when it comes to post-testing? Or are people just not testing this year because this year is kind of crazy? Well, this year is a different story, but in the past we did the same kind of thing. Like once people made a gain, 
we didn't want to just burn people out with testing too many times. And you're right, like teachers can get better, more authentic, more holistic information from conversations and classroom observations on goals and advancements in class placement. Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. We test everybody. At the end of a session, we try to get them in. If they're still with us, um, we've been bringing them back in person. So this week and next week, we've done in-person testing. Yeah, yeah, we have done the same with test at the end. Yeah. But we had found we have found that people who made gains before are still making an yet another gain. So mm -hmm. it it is kind of helpful in a way. Uh, to do it at the end of the program. I agree. Yeah, thanks. Okay. It's also important to um, consider the student's period of participation and make sure that tests will still be valid for when students return. So mm -hmm. at RIRAL, we have students who are coming back for the summer and we have our students who are taking the summer off and they plan to come back in the fall. So again, if we've already gotten an EFL gain from them um, and they're not gonna come back till the fall, we're not worried about testing them right now because that test is not gonna be valid when they register for classes again at the end of September, um, which is when our program will register again. Um, so we have told those students, we'll just wait until we you know, register closer to um, when classes are going to start and then then we'll have them take the test again at that time. That also is helpful because um, if there's any loss of learning over the summer, we want to make sure that their pretest score is that is like more accurate with where they're at and not where they were, you know, four months ago. And then again, just a reminder to consider using um, the reading level indicator for a provisional level. Um, we know that that cannot be used for a measurable skill gain, like you can't use the RLI for a pre or a post test. But if you have a student that is um, going to be getting another kind of outcome, like they're going to be entering a training program or they're going to be entering college um, or they're close to getting their high school credential, um, the RLI can be a, a really useful, quick way of getting um, an assessment on a student so that you can then get that MSG um, in a different way, not, not through EFL. All right, so some new assessments um, that are coming out Wait, soon. Wait, oh, quick question. Oh, yes, do we, sorry. Do we know if the state's still going to let us do provisional um, yes. levels next year? They are? Yep. Yes, they are. Thank you. Yeah, and um, we've we've had conversations, um, Pat, um, our executive director at RIRAL, and Sedalia and I have had conversations with Sophie um, to advocate for the RLI um, being used um, with DLT in different training programs. Um, you know, programs that, that are not connected to NRS, not doing NRS testing, we're really trying to advocate for the RLI being used because again, it's, it's less, um, time and effort that both staff and students <laughs> have to do um, to find out, you know, what level students are at. Um, CASIS is working on um, a math version. I have no idea when that's going to become available. Um, so it's just for reading right now that we can do that quick assessment to see what level they're at. Okay, new assessments. CASAS has two new writing assessments that are coming out this summer. I don't know the exact date, um, but we'll include it in a, our summer newsletters once we know. The first one is called the CASAS Written Prompt Essay. This is currently being used for the NEDP diagnostic phase. Um, so if any programs um, are helping students prepare for NEDP, you might be familiar with that. Um, that is now going to become available through the CASAS e-test. We are very excited about this because it's going to make it so much easier to administer that test for those students in particular. But it doesn't just have to be used with any DP students, it can be used with anybody. So it's only available with the e-test. Um, again, if you are using paper tests in your program, but you pay for TE and you pay for those 100 test units, then you can have access to this test. You can keep using your paper testing for um, NRS purposes. But if you're interested in these writing um, assessments as well, if you pay for TE, you can have access to it. 
Um, the way this one works is the student responds to a written prompt. It's auto scored, so you get the results within seconds, but it is not available for NRS reporting at this time. The second writing assessment is called the writing and language test. Um, it's multiple choice. It's aligned to the CCR, CCRS standards. And some possible uses that CASAS have let us know about is that it could be used as a screening tool for a student's readiness to pass um, the GED or other uh, high school exam. Um, or it could be used um, to help you with class placement. So if you're trying to figure out, you know, what's the best level based on um, students writing and language skills. Um, this test could be used for that. Again, it is not available for NRS testing, so it's more informational. Um, also only available through the e-test. And this one has two levels and it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to complete. I have not seen what these look like yet because they're not available yet. <laughs> this is just the information I've gotten from CAS. Um, before I go on to the next one, any questions about the writing assessments? Okay, and again, just please interrupt and stop me um, as we go along. Okay, so for programs who are using reading goals, um, that series has been approved through 2025, but CASAS is already starting to work on the next goal series. It's already in development. So what that means is the current series may uh, be what's called sunsetted. It may, it may, the NRS, um, Approvability may expire in 2025. Sometimes developing these new tests take longer than what they plan for. So sometimes these tests get extended as you know, those of you who have been in adult ed for a while, you've seen that happen before. Um, so that might be extended before a new uh, goal series uh, comes out, but, but it is in development right now. Um, and for math, um, the math goals is approved through 2023 and the next series is also in development. That one has been in development longer and will be coming out sooner than the new goal series. Um, if you're using the math goals, you know that there's only two levels right now, um, which can be problematic <laughs> at times. Um, CASAS is working on um, changing the math to be, uh, it's, it's gonna be four or five levels, I, I can't remember, um, but it's gonna be more than just the two, the, the new series will include more levels, which I know here at Viral, we're grateful for. Yeah, James giving a thumbs up. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so if you are currently doing e-testing or if you're gonna be doing it in the future, you may see that um, when students are testing, they have in parentheses FT next to their name. And that means that they are receiving field test items. So CASAS has to do research um, in, as part of their process to submit a new test series to, um, uh, for uh, NRS approval. And so um, part of that research includes giving students um, some test questions. Um, they, students will not know if the question they're answering is a field test item or if it's part of the actual test. You as a proctor will not know if the item they are on is part of the actual test or a field test item. Um, and the field test items uh, are not scored. They are not part of the student's score. So whether they answer that question correctly or incorrectly, it does not impact their score. It's just data that uh, CASAS is collecting. Any questions about that? Okay. For um, ESOL, the reading goals and listening goals are being developed or have been developed, I should say, and they are going to be submitted for NRS approval in 2022. CASAS wanted to submit it um, earlier, but COVID just threw everything <laughs> kind of, uh, it delayed everything. Um, so again, CASAS needs to um, test, it needs to give these tests to students to collect data in order for it to be approved and they just have not been able to get enough data um, to submit it for NRS approval. So now their timeline is, um, has been bumped out to 2022. Again, you might see um, FT next to um, your ESOL students who are testing um, and, and they may be receiving field test items. The ESOL reading goals and listening um, will be replacing the current reading and listening series. So if you're using life and work right now, um, that will be replaced by 
uh, the reading goals and listening in the future. That means if you're using paper-based testing, you are going to need to purchase new tests in the future. From what I've seen with um, the AE goals test, uh, it takes a while. <laughs> Once it's been submitted, it still takes a while before it's approved. Um, so I think it's still going to be a couple years before you need to replace your tests. Um, but just know that that is coming in the future. If you use the e-test, you just have access to it. You don't have to pay <laughs> additional money for a new test series. You just you have access to all the test series all of the time. Okay, some additional assessments to know about. There is a test called Reading for Language Arts um, for ESOL students. Um, the form numbers are 513 and 514. Um, these are um, NRS approved, but not in Rhode Island. So um, this is a test that um, might be a better fit than work and reading. It's, it's going to be more reading comprehension rather than reading in a life and work context. So if that's the kind of class that you're running in your program, this might be a good assessment for your students. Um, and if it's something that you would like to use for NRS testing, um, or I'm sorry, for to, to be able to put into LASIS and, and use for outcomes, um, we would need to advocate for that from RIDE. So on a national level, it is approved for NRS, but not at a state level. So it's something we have to advocate for. Um, I did have a meeting with Sophie earlier this week to ask about that process. And she said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the, pro like there is no um, written process that she's aware of, of how a new test series would be approved. Um, but again, it's something that we could advocate for if there are programs who are interested in using it. Again, if you're using the e-test, you already have access to this assessment. You can use it anytime with your students. CASAS also has three citizenship assessments. So if you're working with students who are working on citizenship, um, these are some tests you might be interested in. There is the citizenship interview test, which sounds just like the name. Um, it's going to assess uh, speaking um, skills in a simulated um, oral interview. There's a government and history for citizenship test, which is going to be based on those 100 questions that students need to know. Neither of those tests are NRS approved, but again, if you have access to e-tests, it could be um, something that you're interested in using with your students. And then there is something called um, the Reading for Citizenship. It's a level A test, so it's for low, uh, low level um, English uh, students. Um, it's a reading comprehension in a citizenship context. It is NRS approved, but again, not in Rhode Island. <laughs> so, it, so if it's something that would be useful in your program, um, you can advocate for it, um, for it to become approved in Rhode Island. Any questions about those tests? Is anybody using any of those tests? I don't, I don't think that they're being used in Rhode Island, but I'd be curious if anyone was. So it looks like, um, I'm just checking the chat. So Tom says um, that Progresso has been testing everyone to determine which level of study and asking if there are new, any new tests for ESOL. Um, so uh, yeah, just the, the new goals tests that are in development. And you probably asked that before I, I talked about it. <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, um, CASAS is, is always, always asking for people, especially this year because they've, they've had a limited number of people available to do research, but they're always asking for programs to participate in research. Um, and there, this can be done with the e-test or with paper tests. So they do have paper testing available for these research studies. Students take these brand new tests. Um, so it's kind of nice because you get a little preview of what these new tests are gonna look like. Students get um, some extra testing practice. Um, and then the students receive a $5 gift card for each test they complete, and agencies receive complimentary web testing units. So if that's something that you have the capacity to do and you're interested in, there's a link to learn more. Um, Rural has done this in the past when we've had um, in-person programming going on. Um, we have not done it in COVID times because it's just too much <laughs> for us. I am not going to go over the new um, assessment policy. This is something that was sent out to programs um, 
probably back in end of December or January, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone had access to it. Um, so you can click there to download it. Um, it's a PDF that looks like this lovely ride document. Um, so there, there are some um, updates that were made to the assessment policy um, in terms of um, these new CASAS levels and uh, our CASAS series. Um, so you can, you can read that for fun when you're bored. All right, so we have about 15 minutes left. I'm doing really good on time. I'm, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> it's hard when you're doing this by yourself. Usually Sedalia and I go back and forth. Okay, um, so just a few more things to know about, um, and then we'll have some time to talk about what's uh, going to happen next. So um, I don't know how many people on this call are involved in the end of the year reporting um, that RIDE requires, um, but there are going to be some um, questions related to assessment um, that are going to be included. So this is just giving you a heads up. Um, you're going to be asked to identify who the assessment, assessment specialist is at your agency. Um, you're going to be asked um, the number of tests that you're using per year. So if you're using paper testing, you know, about how many tests do you think you're doing each year? And if you're doing web tests, uh, how many are you using? Um, the question will probably specify how many you use uh, if you were doing in-person programming, because we are assuming that, you know, there may be programs um, that are using less <laughs> web test units this year um, because of COVID. Um, so we're looking for an estimate of, of what you would use, you know, in a, a, a normal year. The reason that we're asking that question, um, so if you don't do this report, if you have, uh, sorry, Jane, were you going to ask a question? Uh, um, are they including like the use of RLI or just the like goals and? Just goals and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know, maybe, maybe getting the RLI information would be um, useful too. So I, I can make a note of that. Um, but the, the reason we're asking this question is because um, right now in Rhode Island, um, individual agencies are responsible for paying for their, their CASAS materials, whether it's paper or, or web tests. Um, there are other models in other states um, where the state um, will, will pay, a, so in Connecticut, for example, a, the state will pay a fee up front, which gives programs a discount, a discounted rate to purchase tests thereafter. Um, so, you know, we're looking at ways that we can save money in the state of Rhode Island and uh, kind of pool our resources together um, so that we can get better pricing. Um, so we're kind of trying to find out, you know, like, well, what, what is the volume of testing in Rhode Island right now? Um, and then we're also going to um, collect some data on um, who's using TOPS Pro um, and if, if programs are not using it, why they might not be using it. Um, again, there could be ways to have, um, instead of individual programming, programs having their own system, um, to have kind of a more unified uh, state system, although that might be less, um, uh, I can't think of the right word, less of a need right now than in the past because there is this data exchange, so, so we can exchange data more easily than, than we could in the past. The CASA Summer Institute is a big conference that happens in June each year that um, Sedalia and I as state trainers will be participating in. Um, Nadine will be there as well. Um, it's virtual this year, so it means like sitting in front of my computer for eight hours <laughs> over the course of four days. Whew, I, I don't know. I, I will have my video turned off and I'll be doing jumping jacks in the background or something. I, I don't know. I, I got to get ready for this. Um, Sedalia and I are presenting at it, um, so we'll be doing that a couple days. Um, but then there's going to be like over 100 presentations from people all over the country that um, talk about, you know, how they're using the CASAS testing or, or just other things that relate to adult ed. Um, so we're, we're excited to, to participate and bring information back to all of you um, from that. So uh, in the summer, we'll probably be sending um, what we've learned and, you know, more, more resources to you. And then there's a link to the June CASAS newsletter. I know Joan sends this out um, every month, but if, if you missed it or if you need a quick link to it, um, it's got even more information than what I'm covering today, um, including uh, best practices um, from other agencies. The, the one from June um, is uh, how to help students with test anxiety, some strategies around that. 
CASAS is also um, developing um, videos to support their training materials. Um, so if you go to the training website and you scroll down to the section that says help documentation and videos, um, you'll find resources there and they are adding new items, um, if not daily, weekly. <laughs> so they are um, really encouraging people to check it out and keep checking it out. All right, and in the last 10 minutes that we have, um, I just want to start thinking about next fiscal year. So, so internally, we've been having conversations about this. Um, we'll be continuing the monthly newsletter. Um, we're um, going to be moving to quarterly meetings instead of these bi-monthly meetings. Um, and we're going to ask that they are attended by um, the assessment specialist from each organization. So we're, we're all staying on the same page with uh, current assessment information. Um, and then, of course, anyone else who's interested in attending um, can attend. So if you think of it kind of like the LASIS user group. Um, so at RIRL, you know, we, we have a designated data specialist who needs to attend those meetings. But several of us in the organization work in LASIS and kind of need to know about the updates. Um, so we have multiple people from our, our organization that attend. And then we're also thinking about offering um, a more in-depth TOPS Pro training. So um, now that we know that it's it's a more affordable option, you know, being able to, to access it for, you know, $360 is, is very affordable. Um, there may be programs that are interested in purchasing it, um, but would like some training on, on how to use it. Um, so it looks like Jane, Jane wants that. She'll be there for that. <laughs> um, but I'd like to turn it over to you guys now. Um, what, what are some more things that you would like to see offered in the future? Are there particular trainings that you would like to see offered? Um, types of information, ways of running these meetings? Um, what do you think? Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm interested because um, I feel like the, you know, the, the CASA serves a, a lot of purposes, but I always feel like the Costas is incomplete the way it is right now. And I'm looking for, and I don't know if it exists because I did at one time they had the Costas speaking, but it's like one test for everybody. And I'm, I'm looking around for something where I could, um, besides the, the reading and the listening, I was wondering if there was some sort of thing coming along or already exists where I could test students for the uh, for their speaking and writing also. Yeah, so there are those new writing tests that are coming out. Um, I'm really curious to see what what level um, those tests are going to be appropriate for. So so a lot of times, you know, for um, for some of our uh, English language learners, we we want to assess their writing, but they might not be ready to respond to a prompt to write, you know, a whole essay. Um, but maybe the prompts are written in a way that, you know, if somebody writes a few sentences, that can give you some information. Um, that writing language test that's going to be multiple choice. Um, again, it's two levels, so I'm curious to see, you know, what does the lower level look like and how how accessible is it to students? Um, so that that's coming, um, but I don't know what it looks like yet. Um, for speaking, um, CASAS doesn't have anything um, specific except for um, that citizenship oral interview um, that I mentioned. I have not looked at that assessment, so I, I don't know what it, what it looks like. Um, and then I think what you were referring to, Tom, is CASAS used to have, or, and I think it's still available on their site, I'd have to look for it. But they had like an oral screening that you could do with um, language learners. Um, where you would kind of, um, there'd be like a rubric to kind of get a sense of, you know, what, what their oral communication skills would be like. Um, but there's nothing NRS approved or, or more than that that I know of. Okay, thank you. Sure. Are there any other programs that, that have ways of assessing um, student speaking skills? Anything else that you guys would like to see for, for next year that would help help your program, help staff? You know, I was just going to add, I think uh, at least one or two programs might be using Best Plus with students, mm -hmm. but I'm not 
completion of which programs? Yeah, from the data that Sophie sent, um, it was just Ed Exchange that it looks like is using um, best right now. Yep. Okay. And is that is is I haven't used best in like 15 years, but is is the best plus is it an oral assessment right now? Yeah, oh, it is. Yeah, I haven't used it in a few years, but a few years ago, yes, and it was all um, the paper version didn't exist anymore at that point in time either. It was, um, you know, you would sit one on one with another with a student, but what the student needed to see when they needed to see it was online. So, um, you know, so you turn it, you turn your computer around, maybe and ask about a picture or something like that. Um, but and I'm pretty sure that's still the format because that was pretty new. Okay. Yeah. So Tom, that might be something to look into. Um, the the best plus. Um, Especially if you're looking, especially if you're working with low level English speakers, um, it's a good test, very good test. Right. Kim, yeah. we've used oral, but um, not any formal assessment. We just created our own. When we do intakes, we normally do a, 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 you know, a quick oral assessment just to kind of give us an idea of where. Oh, you got muted, Melinda. Um, just to give us an idea of what level to place them, if they were able to answer like a full sentence of what, you know, where do you live? If they were actually able to answer that in a full sentence, we would kind of be like, okay, they fell into the category of intermediate or low beginner. So it's not a, a formal, but we do something on paper version that kind of helps us indicate, you know, their, uh, their language level by, um, by the ELL levels. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's good to know about. Be nice to have one that's formal though that we could actually use we've always had to create our own um just to kind of give us some insight on the student and where their you know what their communication ability is but it'd be great to have one to start with because within beginners you have all sorts of levels and then within intermediate you have all sorts of levels so it just to give you an idea of their their communication that was a great piece that's missing i think <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and also because like um, the, the someone's oral skills, oral communication skills and reading skills might might not be at the same level, right? Like you have some students who are really good readers, but their oral communication skill is lower or, you know, the other way around. Yeah. And then it's it's it, it, it does help the teacher when they initially they come into the classroom with that oral um, indication, just because like you said, they might be great uh, at reading and, and writing, but their their oral is just not there. So it just kind of gives her gives them an, an idea of what kind of beginner level they're gonna get <laughs> or what kind of, you know, what level they're in uh, in terms of their ability to speak, to write and read. Yeah, we've created our own. Um, the CASAS is, is most useful because we can test everybody you know, because we have, you know, 300 students, we have to test. So, you know, the, the e-test for reading and listening is, is fine. Um, we just want to make sure that we, in a, on a, some sort of system, systematized way, um, you know, move students to the next level if they need to or stay at the current level. We've created our own series of tests that we use in conjunction with CASAS, but I was just curious to see if there was something more, um, you know, research, you know, because we, we instructed the test ourselves. So I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. Um, Joan put in the chat, if anyone is interested um, in Best Plus, let her know um, because staff would need to be trained um, to use it. Um, so even maybe an informational session to learn more about it um, and then, you know, see if there are programs that want to move forward uh, with using okay. it. Um, reach out to Joan. Yeah, um, I, I used to do a lot of Best Plus, Best Plus <laughs> training. Um, so, you know, if it's something that people say, well, I'm interested, but I don't know. Sure, we could absolutely do, um, you know, a session just to inform you about it and what it looks like. And then um, if people, if people are really interested, then I would definitely set up Best Plus training. So, um, but let me know. And now's a good time because the next fiscal year is starting rather than being in the middle of it. <laughs> um, and Jane, I see your um, comment in the chat too about having a late summer meeting to create new test sessions for the new fiscal year. Yeah. Um, are you thinking of something in August, maybe? 
Yeah, maybe. You know, I know you guys do summer classes, so you'll already flip it in July, but I think most people don't start till late August or early September. And and so just kind of making sure we're on the same. And I want to say thank you to you and Sedalia and everybody else. Like we completely fell into this this year. As you guys know, our testing coordinator passed away and it was like, oh my God, you know, baptism by fire. And um, Kim knows I've spelt, spent a lot of time in their office, like somebody show me. So I, but I'm just anticipating that, you know, okay, we're going to have to create all these new test sessions, not create them because we can copy and paste. And, but if we just had a session, maybe even a working session to make sure we were all doing that right. Um, for those who had tops row, it probably would be helpful, at least to me, it would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and rival has been using this for years. So we've spent a lot of time kind of like, like, um, I don't want to say perfecting it, but like just getting it into a way that is efficient for us <laughs> so that we can like, you know, like get it done and move on to the next thing. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think a working session is a really good idea for anyone who's interested. All right, well, it looks like we're right at um, 1230. So um, thank you for, for being here and, and for sharing out on kind of things that you're doing um, at your agency. Um, if anyone wants to stay on or has any questions um, or wants to see what TE looks like, um, I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes if, if Joan, this is Joan's Zoom session. So if Zoom, <laughs> Joan, Joan has time, she does, good. Um, but otherwise, um, I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim, Joan. I do have a question if you, if you don't mind staying on just a minute, or Joan, just a minute. It'll be a quick question, but. Yeah, yeah, no problem. No, I'm, I'm here. I can stay on for a few minutes. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Kim, great job, by the way. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> So I know people are leaving, but I was curious when you mentioned the difference between enhanced and, and basic, and it's like $360, you just have to buy a hundred. So we literally just bought 1500 um, WPUs because we have the basic. And so I was curious, so I wrote the guy and I'm like, okay, we have these 1500. What, what does that mean if we wanted to go to enhanced? And he's like, well, the basic ones are $2, the enhanced are 260. So instead of having 1700 units, you'd have 1300 units, which means we'd lose like 400 units, which, you know, that's whatever. But is, is do you find it's that much more helpful to have the enhanced? Yes. Yeah, I think so too. Yep, yep. I just think there's so many more, easier to understand, easier to do the reports, but. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I always get this mixed up because I've only known enhanced. So I, I, don't, I don't, I have to like see it in writing to, to know, but, but one of them you can, you can only do either student report, individual reports or only do class reports. And then the enhanced like lets you do both. Um, but I can't remember which way it is. Maybe so, you can only do so individual. I can only do individual. Okay. That's what it is. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. So with enhanced, you could do the class reports, which is nice because you can see, you know, with this group, where, where are people following? Where what, what are the most frequently missed questions for this group um, to have an instructor focus on? Okay. Okay, that was my, it was just quick. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm gonna recommend to Beatrice that she, I mean, I know it feels like we're losing 400 tests, but when you have 1500 tests, that'll get us quite far, so. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. And again, I do thank you all. Make sure you pass that on to others, but you have saved my life. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're happy to help you and, and to work with you with it. We, we know like when we first made the transition, we know how, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming it feels. And so, yeah, anytime we can help people out, we are happy to. <laughs> thank you. All right, have a great weekend. Thanks, you too, bye.